You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking to Joan Hornig, who is the owner of Joan Hornig Jewelry. Perhaps you've seen some of the beautiful pieces adorning many, many people in New York and around the world. In 2003, Joan developed a way to combine her passion for jewelry, education, and philanthropy through the creation of the Joan B. Hornig Foundation. So, Joan, it's an honor to have you with us today. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you. You're, you're very well known for the beautiful jewelry that you make, as well as your extensive experience in the corporate world, in the world of finance, because you worked on Wall Street for many years. Jewelry and business really do sound like very different concepts. What brought the two of them together for you? I'll tell you what's so interesting about it. They sound different, but they're not really so different, or at least they're not so different the way I approach them. One of the things that I learned when I was sitting on a trading desk in Wall Street was that an enormous amount of business is done on trust. Millions and billions of dollars traded with someone on the other end of the phone who you don't know, who you may never see, who all you're doing is believing that they are going to do what they say they're going to do. What I discovered when doing the jewelry business was that it was very much the same way. People, I could go into the Diamond District and people, for a little piece of paper, a memo, would give me a diamond or they'd give me gold or they'd give me another stone and my word would be my bond. And I think that that's one similarity. I think another similarity is that the way I started my business comes out of, in part, um, the kind of investing I had been doing, which had to do with distressed um, investing companies. And when I went in and started to credential myself with the people who would be supplying me things, I said, show me what you have that you haven't sold yet for this season. Let me help you out. Hmm. Um, and so, <laughs> so part of what I did was use that, use that leverage uh, and I think that that's I think that those things are very similar. And I think that those of us who have been on Wall Street know that you have to be a professional and a salesperson generally when you're doing this work. And I don't think that's so different either from the jewelry business. Mm-hmm. So how did you actually start designing jewelry? I started designing jewelry with my youngest child who was, Um, middle school at the time and she was taking a beading course what happened here in New York was that jewelry stringing became the new knitting and after (laughs) after 9-11 I wanted to spend more time with my daughters because I had traveled so much from work and I'd spent so much time away that I moved my business to a home office and in doing that I was able to spend more time with her and do more things in the course of the day. I really did get 24 hours out of a day instead of just a traditional work day. And she was so talented that she inspired me. We started doing this together. And one of um, the women who was a mother of one of her best friends saw my jewelry said, I love your necklace. And I said to her, well, I made it. Thank you. I said, and she said, I thought you were a Wall Street person, a finance person. I said, I am. I said, I am what you are. Um, You know, I'm everything. Uh I am. I'm a mother. I am a wife. I am a professional. I am a teacher. I am a learner. I apply what I do, but I don't just do one thing and I don't define myself one way. And then I told her that I kept all my jewelry at the Tupperware under my china cabinet that I'd been, and she had been in a mommy and me play group many years before with one of the big buyers at Bergdorf Goodman. And she went into my kitchen and she called up and she said, I have something to show you. Well, you, can you see it? And they brought me into Bergdorf's. I showed them and that's really where it began. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I mean, a lot of people do string their own jewelry, but it's nowhere near as impressive as uh, as what you've made. So, 
uh, you, you either you must have a great a great eye for this. Um, well, I, there's I do I do more than that now. But what I did do was I originally started working with um, antique pieces and things that I had collected over the years that I had cast and put into them. So that gave it a difference. Mm-hmm. It stood out right away. Okay, we are talking with Joan Hornig. Uh, of of Joan Hornig Jewelry, but also is the creator and the founder of the Joan Hornig Foundation. So let's talk a little, a little bit about that. You have a very special view on philanthropy, and I think that's how you set up your foundation. Can you tell us how it works and, and, and how the charities that you've been involved with have benefited? Yes, I love to talk about that. Um, when I started making the jewelry and selling it, I knew that I wasn't interested in keeping any of the money for myself. Again, as I referred to earlier, I talked about leverage. And so what I wanted to do, though, was allow everyone to be a philanthropist at the point of purchase. So I decided that if someone bought my jewelry, I would give 100% of my profits to the charity of that purchaser's choice in that person or a designated person by that person's honor. And what that would do is that would spread the word. It would be a pay it forward method. And I took that idea um, really from a combination of Paul Newman and Oprah Winfrey. When I was growing up, Paul Newman was from my town and he was considered clearly the most handsome Jewish actor in, you know, of many generations. And I saw him that way, but my children saw him as a philanthropist at eye level in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. They saw him as, as Newman's own and salad dressing. And I thought, isn't this wonderful that someone with so much talent and so much ability could move his orientation and leave a different kind of legacy as well. And I thought about Oprah Winfrey, who had started out as a newscaster and had taken such an active role and made it so positive for people to care about different causes in her magazine and in her efforts. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could involve everyone at all ages up front Mm -hmm. when they bought my jewelry? So that's how it, that's really how it got started. I created the foundation to be essentially a pass through. I made the decision that I would let, rather than take my assets and put them in a pie and divide it up and say, this much for education, this much for social welfare, this much for, you know, children, seniors, the environment, animals, whatever, I would let the people who bought my jewelry, which are mostly women, of course, Mm -hmm. I would let them tell me real time, again, going back to that trading floor experience as to what was so important to them because that meant that was what was important to the future. And that's how it grew. So it's been really extraordinary. So I guess the title, when they wrote about you in the Wall Street Journal, the, the title of the piece was A Vow of Philanthropy, and you really followed through on that. It's it's. Uh, it's inspiring. I, I, certainly, I hope a lot of people learn from that. On this show, we've spoken a lot about uh, about philanthropy, and one of the, the terms you've used if you, is you've said that philanthropy is a lifestyle. What do you mean by that? I mean that philanthropy is something that everyone can do from from the, being very young. That philanthropy is a fancy sounding word. But you don't have to be a millionaire to give. I think that one of the things that is so beautiful about um, our religion and other religions as well is the belief that you're supposed to give back at good times and happy times, not just at bad times. It's not about making a bargain when something bad happens and say, I'll do it then. It's about always believing that whatever you have, that's great but someone else has less and can use some of it. And there are different ways. And I love I love the lifestyle that we have. I love that at bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, the kids are always at donating. I think it's part of what they say to the congregation. It's part of what they say to each other. It's part of what they say to themselves. They're preparing to before they're 13 years old. That's a lifestyle, philanthropy decision. I think that in the schools, putting community service as an important part is important is 
a lifestyle decision. In the colleges, in the graduate schools, social enterprise is becoming as important as accounting or finance. We're looking at ourselves as citizens of the world with obligations. And I think that there are many ways to define philanthropy, and the best way to define it is by start is to start doing it and taking action. So in my jewelry and in my lifestyle approach to this, I try to put it at eye level and at conversational level so that people, when they comment on something, can say, and I chose to support this by this purchase. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of philanthropy as a lifestyle. Happy occasions, you know, bar mitzvahs, births, weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, everything, and daily life. Okay, so it's a good time to get people to, to remember what's important. Listen, we are just about out of time. We've been talking to Joan Hornig, who is... Uh, the founder of Joan Hornig Jewelry, as well as the Joan Hornig Foundation. But I just want to ask one question, if, if I can, before we wrap up. You've, you've really combined your, your, your own skills from being on Wall Street to being in the artistic world. If someone is looking to combine these two, is there any one point that you could say that maybe overlaps between the artistic world and the business world? I think both worlds are very, very creative, and both worlds require a great integrity and the belief that your greatest risk is one of disappointment. I think that you have to try. If you want to do this, you try and surround yourself with the best people and learn to listen to what they're saying. You learn a lot from young people. You learn a lot from people your age. You learn a lot from people who are senior to you. Keep your ears open and your heart open and you can combine the art and passion and business in a very exciting way. And how can people learn more about the work that you're doing? They can learn more about it by going to my website, which is joanhornig.com. Um, they, can, they can see it in various stores around the country. They can look into my – I hope that if they go to my site, what they'll do is they'll also go to the foundation page where they can see that we have over 700 foundations that we've donated to just because people have asked us to. And you can scroll down. It takes a long time, which is, I guess, the good news. And you can see the different causes that people care about. Wow. That's fabulous. Joan Horning, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. Take care now. Thank you. you You've too. been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.